The sky is not the limit. It's only the beginning. This quote is said by my guest for today. An aviapreneur from the US, originally from Scotland. Welcome, Dr. Anita Singupta. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Great to see you again. Thank you very much. This is Adnan Barambo, and this is a new episode of Aviapreneur's podcast. Uh, Dr. Anita is an aviapreneur uh, who ha- who is having uh, a Master of Science degree and a PhD degree from uh, in aerospace engineering from the University of Southern California. She has worked for some of the world's most prestigious companies and organizations. She, she started her career working for three years as an engineer for Boeing uh, Space and Communications. And then she worked for 17 years in NASA. Imagine, I'm talking to someone who worked for NASA, the, the, the organization that everybody enjoy listening uh, to their news and announcement. Dr. Anita was uh, a senior engineer and a project manager re- responsible for some of NASA's most important missions like Venus, Mars, and the International Space Stations. Later, she worked for uh, Virgin Hyperloop as a senior vice president between 2017 and 2019. And then in 2020, she decided to quit and start her own revolutionary aviation startup, Hydroplane. Uh, she's also a, a professor uh, in aerospace engineering in uh, USC as well. And I'm very happy to be speaking to Dr. Anita today. We're going to start about Hydroplane, your startup which aims to revolutionize the aviation industry by creating hydrogen fuel cell power plants. Can you tell us more about what Hydroplane is aiming to introduce to the world of aviation? Sure. So um, I'm also a very avid pilot myself. And actually, my primary hobby is flying small planes. And obviously, climate change is the number one challenge, I would say, for our society at large. And so I wanted to do something using my skills as an engineer to help to decarbonize aviation. And one of the ways to do that with propeller driven aircraft is to electrify them. So just like you can have ground based electric vehicles, you can also have an electric aircraft. So with electric propulsion, you can then minimize CO2 output, but then you have to choose what is my energy storage technology going to be? Is it going to be lithium ion batteries or is it going to be hydrogen fuel cells? So at Hydroplane, we're developing a power plant which is based off of hydrogen fuel cells as the energy storage technology to be able to make aviation carbon emission free. That's a very interesting mission. And uh, where are you now in in, in this mission? So we are in the design and prototyping phase. So we have um, two Air Force contracts actually to develop the technology. And so we'll do our first flight demonstration in early 2023. Um, And then we will sell, obviously, hopefully directly to the government customer and then also sell to the commercial customer. This is very interesting. So you're actually planning to target both general aviation and commercial aviation. Yes. So it's more basically the size of the power plant, like how big um, of an engine do you currently have a combustion engine? And therefore, what would you need for an electric propulsion system to replace it? And and the bigger vision, uh, do you think one day we can see the big jets flying on this technology? Our vision is to extend to regional travel. So basically large single engine aircraft like a Pilatus as well as multi-engine turboprop aircraft. So that's kind of our vision is the regional market. So we're not focused on the jet um, aircraft market just because I think it requires a different technology. There's a low temperature PEM technology. There's also a high temperature PEM technology, but it's something we would consider in sort of a generation three system. That's very, that's very interesting indeed. But how big is the team working for Hydroplane? Oh, gosh, I think we're up to almost 20 people now. So we've grown very rapidly in the past two years. um, And uh, most of us are based in Southern California, but we do also have employees around the world. But this is very interesting, actually, because you grow that fast in the most difficult time uh, in which aviation was passing through at the same time in, uh, in the current phase where it's very hard to find the qualified and willing human resources. How could you achieve that? Well, so one of the benefits of being a university professor is I have a really large network of other professors at other universities and also former students. So I was able to tap into that network and bring them onto the team. 
That's very interesting. But at the same time, growing that fast in such revolutionary and innovative technology require a lot of resources and require a lot of financing. How could you achieve that? So we did a combination of private investment raising as well as government contracts to be able to provide us with both investment as well as revenue. And also in our second contract, we make a profit off of it. So the government will be a customer and investor at the same time? Well, I suppose in a sense, any government uh, expenditure in the research world is viewed as a return on investment because ultimately it creates jobs. And so we're part of the small business program in the United States. And when you take a look at the um, sort of the ROI from the small business program, it's huge, actually, in terms of like the, the government puts in a certain amount of dollars, the company then grows and then creates even more dollars as a result. So it's kind of a combination um, effort. So I would say, yes, investment, but not in the traditional way that you think of investment, more about return on investment because they're investing in a United States company and creating jobs. I understand. I understand. Uh, here I have a question that comes to my mind. You worked for on big projects and for a huge organizations that have un, almost unlimited resources. You quit all that and you decided to do it on your own. Why did you do that? Why do you think startups can achieve innovations and, and creative uh, projects that big companies are incapable of achieving? So that's a great question. And there's many different um, layers to why that is. Uh, one, of course, is just the size of an organization. It means it would have a large overhead rate. So when you have an incredibly large overhead rate, which is you know double what you're paying somebody or triple or quadruple what you're paying somebody per hour, then of course, there's that level of inefficiency. When you're a small company, your overhead rate is quite small because you don't have as many facilities. You don't have as much infrastructure in terms of people as well as facilities, as well as capital expenses. The other two is when you're small, you can be more agile. You can move more rapidly. Um, you don't have as many processes and paperwork steps that you have to get through. And so if you're trying to do something which is on the prototyping phase, it's more of an R&D environment, which is more amenable to a smaller entity. But did you try while you were in the corporate world to propose to them uh, these ideas and vision you had? Did you feel resistance that made you go and do it on your own? Well, I've always been a research technologist, so I've done many uh, research technology projects at NASA, for example, in the electric propulsion world, ironically, but for spacecraft, and also um, for entry descent landing systems for Mars and for Venus and for Earth reentry. So I'm used to working in actually really in more constrained budgets with more rapid timelines because of that research aspect. But when you look at the return on each dollar you put in, when you're a small company, you get much larger ROI because you don't have those losses associated with the overhead, um, and you also can have a different type of team. Team, right, you can pull in people who are students. You can pull in people who are, um, you know, part-time employees. You can pull in um, partners from academia, for example, a student working on a PhD thesis. We have somebody on the team who's like that too. So there's different ways that you can operate your business when you're smaller, when you're in control of it, than you can in a much larger organization. So there are unfortunately inefficiencies that come with size, right? And of course, we're trying to grow, which means eventually we'll have some inefficiencies too. But we're at such an early stage that we're very efficient in terms of we spend our funding. Indeed, I agree with you. Going back to hydroplane, uh, when do you think is the time where most of the airplanes of the world will operate on such kind of technology? Because you're going to start, uh, as you mentioned, next year. But how much you think is the time frame required to really change how air how airplanes currently fly to the future? So it is a very difficult um, question to answer because there's many pieces to that puzzle. And the one when it comes to a new form of fuel would be how do you have the infrastructure to support that? So there's the technology development aspect on the vehicle side, on the aircraft side that we're working on. Then there's also the infrastructure aspect that has to come from other companies and from you know local governments, uh, state governments, federal governments. And so those two things have to happen in parallel to make it work. And the great analogy there would be hydrogen fuel cell cars. Right. So the technology exists. You can buy actually several models in the United States. But right now, the only state that has the infrastructure to support refueling those vehicles is California. So therefore, it delays the rollout. So I think if there were uh, if there was more investment on the infrastructure side, on the governmental side, as well as on the private investment side, then we could see it definitely before the end of the decade, um, a, a large transfer, especially of smaller aircraft. But it's got to be both of those things. So we're doing the technology, but we also need um, governments to focus on the infrastructure. So th this is a situation in the US. How, how about the other countries? Are they t taking this issue seriously? 
I mean, I think everybody is taking it seriously, but I think with anything that involves, you know, decisions of budgetary consequences, there's politics that are involved and obviously political cycles will change with every year who's coming in and out of office. I do think there is a lot of support for hydrogen in Asia. So I know uh, Japan has a lot of initiatives um, and I think China has initiatives as well. There's a lot of support for hydrogen in Europe, for sure, um, for not only for transportation use cases, but for um, energy carrier use cases for anything from um, um, you know, manufacturing to um, home and business electricity supply. So there is a, a movement of foot to make investments in the infrastructure, uh, but that really does have to happen as uh, quickly as possible. Uh, and then we have to figure out the best places to install that infrastructure to support vehicle fueling. So in, in Southern California, it's great. We've got lots of hydrogen fueling stations, which means that you can buy those cars. Same thing with battery power cars. You can buy them, you can charge them, or you can fuel your hydrogen fuel cell cars, but you have to make decisions as to where you put that infrastructure first. So you get the best return on investment on it. So people are definitely talking about it. And then the other element here is that there are federal incentives in the United States related to production of green hydrogen or blue hydrogen, um, you know, as opposed to gray hydrogen, because mm -hmm. um, we can talk about that more if you want to as well. Uh, having discussed uh, your startup and the technology you're working on, I would like to move on to your own career. Senior uh, engineer, a project manager, professor, senior vice president. You decided to leave all of that and to become a startup founder, an entrepreneur. All these positions and titles you had are amazing, amazingly successful. Actually, if someone only have one of them, they will consider themselves a successful uh, achiever, but you are not satisfied. Do you think entrepreneurship uh, gives someone that uh, satisfying feeling that other positions in the academia and the corporate world are lacking are lacking of giving them the same the same excitement the same pleasure it depends on your personality and i definitely have always had very much a you know go getter personality and just want to kind of implement things um, as efficiently and as quickly as possible and things that are very difficult so i think when you are of that mindset sometimes if you're part of an organization then you have to go through levels of approval that may not be that efficient in your mind and so if you're that kind of personality then you probably would really enjoy being an entrepreneur because you're in complete control of your own destiny it is of course a very different situation because you have a lot more risk in terms of you know having to take responsibility for your entire company, for all your people, the entire legal aspect, being able to raise funds to have customers. So when you're part of an electric organization, somebody else is taking care of that. So it definitely has a different sort of you know, uh, emotional toll on you. Um, but if you really want to uh, be in control of your own destiny, then entrepreneurship is kind of the way to go. But at the same time, the media and the actual success story of all these startups somehow taught us or gave us the impression that in order to succeed as an entrepreneur, you have to be a university dropout. You have to be someone who's not academic. But for you, you're, you reach the top of the academia world having a PhD and, and you actually taught and worked for uh, hugely successful research institutions, but you still were able to make it as an entrepreneur. So there is no contradiction between achieving academic success and entrepreneurial success. Oh, I, at all. And actually, it helps me because I'm able to write really good technical proposals because I already did that as a research technologist working for NASA and working for academia. So it was very easy for me to transition those skills into um, writing technical proposals, um, you know, from governmental um, either grants or contract opportunities. So it actually helps me quite a bit. And I think it's pretty rare for a brand new company to get um, to win the two contracts that we did. It's because I was already really good at writing technical proposals. So <laughs> it actually trained me. So I would encourage more people from academia to actually you know start their own companies and in the united states there actually are a lot of professors who do that it's just sometimes they're not the ceo of the company they're just the cco of the company for me mm -hmm. i've always really enjoyed um the business challenges i've always enjoyed the organizational growth um challenges so i really wanted to be the ceo because i i enjoy the technical as well as the programmatic so I find those both very satisfying. And then to be honest with you, um, you know, as somebody who, who looks like me, which is, you know, a woman and a woman of color, there are very few people like me who are in the aerospace entrepreneur space and in general in the entrepreneur space. So I also really wanted to make a difference in that way. But do you think being a woman, as, as you explain it, do you think uh, this helped you or actually played against you? Uh, did you feel any resistance or any more difficulty by being a woman in this industry? 
Well, in general, I've always been a male-dominated industry, which is aerospace. So I have received my fair share of inappropriateness <laughs> towards me. Um, and I've seen that as well in the uh, venture capital space. So unfortunately, that is there. Um, but the more women there are, the, the less acceptable that becomes, the less likely it is to happen. So it's hard for me to quantify it because, right, it would be anecdotal. Um, but certainly, you do sometimes face some challenges because of that. But I never let that stop me before, so I wouldn't let it stop me now. Mm. Uh, what, in your uh, uprisings, did you always see yourself becoming an entrepreneur and becoming someone who enjoy exploration? Because in one of your interviews, I heard uh, you saying that science fiction actually played a big role in your uh, career, uh, in shaping your career. So uh, how, how do, you, do you encourage people to read more science fiction? I remember in one of Harvard studies, uh, uh, done almost 10 years ago, they said that people who read fiction are better leaders. For me, I rarely read fiction. But after reading that study, I changed because normally I say, okay, I don't have time for fiction. I read nonfiction. Maybe I watch fiction. But then I discovered that reading fiction makes you a better reader because you have better imagination, better creativity. So what's your take on that? Well, yeah, I'm a humongous science fiction fan. So it's the reason why I became an engineer is because I loved um, science fiction, specifically anything having to do with space travel. So that's what made me become an engineer. And if you poll lots of engineers, they all say the same thing. Yeah, I love Star Trek. I love Star Wars. I, I love this genre. I love that genre. So that is pretty consistent. And certainly um, there is a quote actually in the Science Fiction Museum in Seattle, which is that science fiction inspires a sense of wonder in people, which is basically it really inspires your imagination. And so I think um, that is uh, an aspect of my personality personality that certainly couples between you know my imagination as well as wanting to create a new future but yeah basically if you have that mindset then you want to be able to you know create the future that you imagine it to be um but yeah i'm not a reader of nonfiction because i like to you know in my downtime i like to escape to something else so the last thing i want to do is read something which is too close to my regular life or even in the fictional space something which is too close to my regular life that's why i like science fiction and fantasy <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Anita. I really enjoyed talking to you. Before we uh, and, and learning about your startup and I'm sure all the amazing things you are doing to the world, before we close, I'm sure all the aviapreneurs listening to us and uh, following us, whether male or females, whether men or women, they would like uh, to hear your recommendations on what should they do, uh, what path they should follow to achieve some of the success you have achieved. What do you recommend them to do? Well, I think you have to find something that you love, something that you feel passionate about, um, a way that you feel like you can make a difference. I think you should always be motivated by wanting to help others and help society as opposed to getting wealthy. And if you can find a way to monetize what it is that you love and convince somebody to invest in it because it would actually make money, that's a positive thing. And, and I actually think one of the most amazing things for me about being an entrepreneur is the fact that now I create jobs for other people and I feel like I'm helping people and giving them a new opportunity. And that is just something I was never able to do when I wasn't, you know, the owner of the organization um, perspective. But I also think it makes sense to learn from others. So my, I would say key to my successes that I've had in different aspects of my career is that I always went into something which was beyond my current skill set or beyond my current knowledge. But then I surrounded myself with people. I had mentors who helped me, who taught me how to do this new thing better. And then I was able to do the new thing. So in the context of um, becoming an entrepreneur, um, meet up with other entrepreneurs, perhaps join, like we're part of the Viterbi Startup Garage. So join an incubator, um, join a startup garage, then they can help you um, get through some of these challenges because no one can know anything. And my favorite quote comes from Socrates is the only thing that we know is that we don't know anything. <laughs> That's very interesting, actually. Uh, so um, serving, having a network, continuous learning, is what you recommend them to do. Yes, that's, that's well put, better than what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Anita. I really enjoyed talking to you and I learned a lot from you and I'm sure all the entrepreneurs uh, have shared the same with me. I wish you all the best and I look forward to meeting you again in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, fellow entrepreneurs. I'm sure you enjoyed the, the discussion of today as I did. I look forward to seeing you again next week with another episode and another amazing entrepreneur. Have a great day.